This is News 12 Connecticut, as local as local news gets. Now, the Daytime Edition. Hey, welcome back to the News 12 Connecticut Daytime Edition, as local as local news gets. I'm David Smith. And hello, I'm Heather Kovar, in for Rebecca Saran. According to our next guest, some 70% of marriages are expected to end in divorce by the year 2005, Dave. Isn't that a great statistic to start off with? Our next guest has some suggestions on how to emotionally prepare yourself if you must divorce. She is the founder of the website divorce.forum. Dot com, which since 1999 reportedly has received more than 4 million hits. And here to reveal her divorce survival secrets is relationship expert Susan Allen. Susan, hi. Good to have Hello. you with us. Good morning. 70% is, is just a stunning. I mean, it used to be 50% and that was reeling enough. And you know what's frightening? Second divorces are less successful than first. The average marriage lasts for seven years. So I've now committed the rest of my career to teaching people how to avoid divorce. Hmm. Because mm -hmm. there are three crucial elements that most people just don't understand. One, avoid marriage. <laughs> Is that not one of them? Oh, there we no, go. Heather. Well said, Heather. <laughs> Though I must say, everybody finds that quite amusing. Mm -hmm. The first thing that's absolutely crucial is to understand that there are seven stages of love. Okay. And as you get closer and closer to this ultimate unconditional love, which is the basis for a good, lasting relationship, you go from dependency, need, control, support, that starts to be good, mm -hmm. intimacy, vulnerability. And vulnerability, you're almost at a wonderful relationship, and that's where most people panic. The last and seventh stage of love is unselfconsciousness where you can just be together and, you, and it feels perfectly natural and it's almost like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers mm -hmm. dancing but most people panic at vulnerability because they don't want what, to. What time frame are we talking about here Susan? This, this uh, sounds like it could take a long time <laughs> and people jump into relationships as you know <laughs> Well, Instantly. you know, it depends on how close someone really is because obviously I'm America's leading divorce coach. I do a lot <laughs> of divorce and post-divorce coaching. Mm -hmm. So I teach a lot of people how to survive their divorce and then how to heal from the divorce. And we have an e-book that's 101 Divorce Survival Secrets. And it's, you know, downloadable. Nobody even knows these secrets. And so they're getting killed in the courts. But we want them to avoid divorce. Mm -hmm. That's so the most. In avoiding it, you know, what, what is the problem? People aren't making it pass. I mean, intimacy is usually pretty easy. Or you Depends think, you what think kind. it is. <laughs> exactly. So, so what's the problem? Are they not willing to continue to work on it? Or? Yeah. yeah. I have a number of clients that call me and say something like, and I, I give one hour of free telephone coaching. Mm -hmm. So if they go to thedivorceforum.com, and they send us an email, they will get an hour of free coaching. We answer uh, emails happily, pro bono. This mm -hmm. is, we have a huge pro bono section of our business. But in any case, they just don't understand how to create this communication. They don't understand that there are four languages that we speak as humans because there are four brain lobes. So if you are mostly logical or analytical, and you fall in love with a man or a woman who's mostly creative and a visionary, then you need to learn each other's language. You need to listen in a very different way. You need to let go of all those criticisms and all those judgments mm -hmm. of yourself and of them. So opposites may attract, but they may not be able to communicate. That's right. <laughs> or get That's along. right. And That's that right. will cause long-term or even not so long-term problems, big problems. Sure, sure, because you know you have that wonderful honeymoon phase where you're just getting to know each other and he's brilliant or she's brilliant and he's beautiful or she's beautiful and then you go home and you don't know how to communicate. You don't know how to navigate day-to-day -day life. And usually what happens is you're either going to be in self-judgments or judgment of your spouse. And when I teach them nonviolent communication, it separates those criticisms from what are your needs? And if you have a need for support, how could your spouse automatically know that? Mm -hmm. If you have a need for financial security, mm -hmm. well, why don't you come up with a strategy that works for both of you? So if it you all comes love, back to communication, yeah. it does, doesn't it? It does. And we teach them something that is absolutely radical, un un unheard of, unconditional love. I have ministers who come to me and are horrified when I say, I'm teaching you unconditional <laughs> love for your spouse. You've heard of this, I think. <laughs> it's hard, though. 
are right in the middle of not agreeing on something and you're living with someone and you can't get away from them, just think you've got to love them no matter what. That's right. Heather, that's why that lovely dog, Wilhelmina, is that your, is that your knee, my dear? Yes, she Susan, is. thank you so much for being with us. You're so welcome. Great to thank see you. you. So in the year 2001, 60% of all marriages ended in divorce. And the government projects that in the year 2005, 70% of all marriages will end in divorce. And I don't know about you, but to me this is unacceptable. Because when we get married, we marry because we're in love. And when we get divorced, usually our hearts are broken. And as a divorce coach, I know what it's like to have to pick up the pieces. And as a, as a human being, as a woman, who's had two divorces, I know what it's like to heal. And it's horrible. And there is, as far as I'm concerned, no possibility of seeing ourselves going to a 70% rate, to a 75, to an 80% rate. There must be a solution. We have to get off what I call the merry-go-round. So I'm guessing that you all kind of agree with me, that this is just no, no way to go. And I've discovered a solution. And people find the solution shocking. And they find it very, very, very confusing. When I speak about unconditional love, it isn't anything that people have really heard about. Because even though we're sitting in a church tonight, you hear about unconditional love of God for humans. You may hear about the unconditional love that a mother or even a father has for children. We've certainly experienced unconditional love if we've ever had a pet. We don't say one day, why is my dog not handsomer? Why is he not bringing home more money? And we go through these heroic measures to keep them alive. I know I am right now. I have a dog who's going to be 16, and I'm basically carrying him around the house. I don't really want to have him put to sleep. And this is unconditional love. Yet, if I say to any one of you who's married or been married, did you love your spouse unconditionally? Invariably, the answer is going to be, well, yeah, sometimes I did. And in fact, tonight when I got here, I had a conversation with one of you. And I was very, very specific. And I laughingly said to the person to whom I spoke, no pass. That's not unconditional love. Unconditional love is not if so-and-so does what you want when you want it. That's just not what it is. That's what I call the connubial blitz. And that is the first step to divorce. So if we're looking for a way to make, perhaps, perhaps it's too late and we're already divorced. Well, what are you going to do next time around? You do not want to repeat the misery, the agony, the pain, so that you can then talk to me after your next marriage is start of, you know, starts to flounder. Am I right about that? And if you have a choice. You're either going to be looking, well, how am I feeling? Am I healing? The, ma the marriage isn't going well, but I'm still in there. I'm still fighting. I'm still struggling. I, I want to learn. I want to make it work. Or you may already be in a situation where you're just living in fear. Not only fear of the ex, but fear of all men or women, because the pain is so great. The marriage is not going well, or the last marriage was so painful. So that's another indicator that there's a lot of healing that needs to happen. The third is, I have a lot of people who tell me, well, you know, I, I had a young man, a 44-year-old man, tell me a few days ago, well, I pretty much figured that I'm just going to spend the rest of my life alone. I, 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 mean, I was devastated. This is a handsome, brilliant, charming, successful 44-year-old man who's had two devastating divorces. And I suggested to him that there might be something he wanted to do to work out his problems, work out his issues, work on his own fear. He said, no. <laughs> no, but that's, you know, that's where he is. And I said, well, you know what? You have my phone number. What am I going to do? You know. Many people think that they'll just avoid dating. Well, you know, even if you get a divorce when you're in your 60s or your 70s, what are you going to do for the next 20 years if you live longer? Just avoid the whole issue? Just pretend it didn't happen because the thought of healing is so horrific? Not at all. I mean, I find that the fear of healing, the fear of oh, whatever it is you think you're going to have to go through, 
in order to heal is far, far worse than the actual process of looking at whatever behaviors we've had that weren't working. Now, there was one story that I heard very recently, which is, is just, it's a classic and I want to share it because most people don't understand that there comes a time when one or the other spouse indicates, I've had it. And normally, the other spouse panics and runs. And the spouse who's the first one who made the statement, I've had it, and ironically, that statement can be silent. You could actually be sitting with one of your women or men friends and you could say, you know, I've really had it. I've been married for 35 years and I'm not taking another minute of this. And you go home and a week or so later, you're shocked to discover that your spouse is out the door or that he's got another girlfriend or she's got another boyfriend or she took the kids and off they go. And you always think that it's your spouse who did it. And I hate to tell you that I learned this myself the very hard way. <laughs> because my husband one day said to me, you don't love me. And I was really angry with him. And many of us would have said I was justified. And I jumped to the first thing I thought on my mind was, yeah, I don't. How dare you treat me that way? I said, you're right, I don't love you. And a month later, he had a mistress. It might have been less than a month. It might have been a day later. I don't know. He might have actually left the house and gone straight to the phone. I mean, you know, who knows with these things. But one thing is absolutely sure. When he said to me, do you love me? And I said, no, I don't. He was in a panic and he ran. Now, I wish I could tell you that that was the only time that happened to me. And I wish I could tell you that that was the last time it happened to me. But since there isn't any divorce coach, any relationship coach, any therapist who has ever pinpointed that danger until I identified it. There was nobody who could say to me, incidentally, Susan, don't do that again. That really doesn't work. And it's very unusual for somebody to say this because we don't realize that there's fear and there's love. And if you're experiencing fear, you're not experiencing love. It's one or the other. If you're having the thought, oh my God, he's cheating on me, you're not actually being present with him, loving him, and being fully available to him. If you're having the fear, she's leaving and she's taking her mother's money with her, then you're not going to be really there and being present and really being loving. And if you're pretending to do all that, but in the meantime, everybody's meeting with their mediators and their attorneys and all the other things, you're not really being together. The fear is there. I once spoke to a woman, a, a client, and she said, you know, I met this great guy. But I said to him, you know, I just came out of a relationship and I'm not really ready. And I was really surprised, she said, when he didn't call. <laughs> I said, you told him that you weren't ready. He obviously had his own fears. So between the two of you, you didn't have the price of a bus fare. You're scared. He's scared. What was the point? I said, you saved yourself a lot of time and trouble. Now, if you had been able to come to a different place with yourself, a place where you really were calm, a place where you really felt unconditional love for yourself, where you had found peace with whatever had gone on in the past in your life, do you think that that man who found you attractive wouldn't have called again? She said, well, of course he would have. So that's the secret. And the secret is that we are totally in control of what turns out in our life. And I don't mean necessarily that my ex-husband might, might not have continued and, and moved on in his life. But there are what? How many billions of people on the planet Earth today? So any of us that are alive and any of us that are alone or any of us that are in relationships that are not satisfying need only to look to ourselves to see that we're not calm, we're not unconditionally loving ourselves, we're not unconditionally available to be loved and to share love. And there is a huge, huge opportunity so the good news is there's nobody else to blame. And the bad news is that there's nobody else to blame. So a lot of people become quite excited when they realize that there's so much of a difference that they can make in their own life. And then a lot of people become incredibly furious about it. So what is remarkable about self-empathy? 
is it is a miraculous opportunity to come to peace within yourself no matter what is going on around you. And the way that you do this, this was discovered by a man named Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, who was the founder of the Center for Nonviolent Communication. He was a psychotherapist for many, many years, and he said that having a PhD just gave him the opportunity of having fancier labels to call people. Instead of saying, you're crazy, he would say, you know, you're, you're clinically depressed or you're a uh, sociopath. But basically, it didn't change anything because everybody has feelings and everybody has needs. So if you're in a marriage and you're feeling frightened, that's a feeling. Then the question is, what's the need behind it? Well, mostly we're feeling frightened because we have a need for some kind of safety. It may be emotional safety to know that we're loved. And I now see with my clients that if I can give them empathy, what are they feeling? What are they needing? What are they feeling? What are they needing? Eventually, there's a certain opening that occurs, and then you can talk about strategies. And it's really remarkable. If you're in a panic, if you're doing this fear versus love thing, you cannot possibly come up with a strategy. It will not work. Just as if someone is in a state of terror, you have to calm them down before any kind of rational conversation is possible. So what's beautiful about this, what's remarkable about this, is that if you can give yourself self-empathy, then if your spouse or your children or your business associates come at you with some sort of drama, instead of being reactive and feeling defensive and screaming or becoming depressed or withdrawing or any of the things that we've done forever that don't work, you can just kind of breathe be with your own feelings and needs, know what's going on with you, become calmer and calmer, not be immediately thinking, I need a divorce! <laughs> because we know that that's not what you really need. Because we know that the next spouse is probably not going to be different from the last spouse, is probably not going to be different from the next spouse, and the next because what's the same as us? And in fact, for people who've been married many, many times, like Liz Taylor's a classic, we know that there was one constant. Liz was always there. You know, in all those marriages and all those divorces, Liz was there. You know, the guys changed. Some of them were rich. Some of them were poor. Some of them drank. Some of them didn't drink. Some of them were this. Some of them were that. But Liz was the constant. And of course, the truth is the same in both of my marriages, the same in my relationships and the same with all my clients. And what is so remarkable about self-empathy is we can stop the chatter and the defensive behaviors that we have with our family. The seven stages of love, and this is really important, because when you're thinking that you're loving someone unconditionally, and you really believe it, I wonder, and I think the most valuable thing we can do is notice how we feel about ourselves. You know, if we look in the mirror and we have a thousand judgments about ourselves, then we're not in the habit of unconditional love. And there's very little chance that we're going to love somebody else more than we love ourselves. And since our children are part of us, there's every possibility in the world that if you've got these thousand judgments about yourself, then you probably believe that your children should do a little better, try a little harder, be a little different. Now, here's a great way of judging. The first three stages are part of attachment, and they are dependency, need, and control. If anybody has ever, ever thought somebody else is controlling, I don't like to be controlled, I don't like being told what to do. There's a very good chance it's because we have a control thing ourselves. Because, you know, if you love someone and if you're in a loving relationship, then there's the issue of let's make it work, whatever it is. It's not even compromise. If you really love unconditionally, it's not even a question of compromise. It's a question of giving yourself and the other person giving himself or herself, and it just works. It's a dance. You don't go out on the dance floor and uh, waltz together and think that you're compromising. You don't even have that thought. So it's a kind of an interesting shift that you make. When you get into the second three, which are called engagement, and they are support, intimacy, and vulnerability. Mostly with intimacy, we're talking about physical intimacy. And what's so amazing is 
lots and lots of people do this all the time and there's little or no vulnerability. There's little or no unselfconsciousness. True unconditional love is unselfconsciousness. And if you've ever been really intimate, you believe, with a spouse or a partner of any kind, then it's a question of not having that little voice in your head that says, I'm to this, I'm not this enough, he or she is to this, he or she isn't this enough. If we're doing that little voice thing, we're not, definitely not, in unselfconsciousness. And there's a lot of work that we can do with self-empathy. The beauty of self-empathy is that you can practice this for the rest of your life. It's like a computer. Computer, you have to have one finger that works and you can always communicate with the rest of the world. With self-empathy, you just have to be able to have thoughts and you can either really connect with somebody else when someone else is telling you a story about a painful time they went through. You can just listen, but listening in a way that we have never been taught to listen before. Listening with an open heart and not with a whole story. And the way to do that is to give ourselves self-empathy first. Because if your spouse or your new relationship or the relationship you're hoping to create or the relationship you'd like to transform that's already looking pretty grim is a conversation between two people and there are two people who are silently listening. So there are two people speaking and then each of you are silently listening. And if you can train yourself in self-empathy, and really, you don't need anything more than this little exercise. And I have people that do this, and they practice it and practice it, and their lives turn around radically, remarkably. Because what we're all longing for is someone who really is with us, someone who really connects. And that's what is so rare because we're all busy defending ourselves and protecting ourselves and judging ourselves and correcting ourselves like our mothers and fathers and our teachers did to us. And that's not unconditional love. And that's not unselfconsciousness. So there are seven stages of divorce, which are also seven stages of life. And once you can find your way to the seventh stage, which is peace, you will have an amazing, amazing shift. And just to let you know what the seven stages are. And all of this is on my website, and all of this is available free through emails and all the rest of it. But just tonight, it's panic, denial, agony, rage, epiphany, negotiation, and peace. And peace is the seventh stage. And there are three different options with peace. The first one is that you can make peace. Let's say a situation is really bad. Well, you have no choice but to ride the horse in the direction it's going if you can't get that horse under control. So letting go can be the first step of evolution. Sometimes there's nothing else we can do except make peace with the situation, make the best of it. You know, you may have you know, lost the battle, etc., etc. And there's another day tomorrow, and if you give yourself self-empathy, and give this person empathy. There's no knowing what's possible. And I've seen this now thousands of times with people in their lives. The second way with peace is to find peace. So you eliminate that situation from your life. It was not working. It was hopeless. You've given up. Now you can find peace elsewhere. Because as long as we're alive, we have literally millions of options in every possible capacity. Not only millions of options in relationships, but in our work, in our friendships, with our children, with our family. There are so many ways to have a wonderful, satisfying life. Sometimes we make a mistake and we think it's only that guy or that woman. But it's never really true. It's never, ever really true. There are always thousands of opportunities if we would only open our hearts to them. And then the third thing is finding ourselves at peace. And that is the most beautiful one. So that no matter what happens outside, no matter what happens outside of our, our body and our, and our own entity, we can find ourselves at peace. And the way to do that, again, is through self-empathy and empathy. And it works 1,000% of the time. 